There are certain matches, certain moments, certain things in professional wrestling that transcend place and time. They live on well past the memories of many other things start to fade off into the sunset. And you think about it from a WWF standpoint, you think about Hogan body slamming Andre at WrestleMania 3. Think about Austin bringing down Mc, the McMahon family and The Rock with the beer truck. Um, you think about Austin and the Zamboni. You, you, you think about some of these things and you think about King of the Ring 1998 and you think about that match, some of the moments in that match, and they truly are timeless. Those memories will live on long after all of us are gone. King of the Ring 1998 is a show that everybody thinks about. And yes, it's associated with that one match and a couple of those moments, but fucking better to be remembered for that than be totally forgotten in the wastebasket of wrestling history. That's for damn sure. But when you look back at King of the Ring 1998, it certainly goes down in history and is an iconic show and easily the best of the King of the Ring shows because of that one match. And you're going to say, well, I think maybe another show had better matches on who gives a shit. Do you really fucking remember that? Would the average person really remember those things? No. When you think of King of the Ring, everybody naturally gravitates toward 1998. That makes it the greatest King of, Ring, King of the Ring pay-per-view of all time. Not even close. Not even up for debate at this point. It's the one that everybody remembers. And, <clears throat> you know, just like the Montreal Screwjob. Survivor Series 1997. Like these are these iconic moments in time that we've relived over the decades. And it's that one match. But you go back to this show, June 28th, 1998, and you, you look at a company that was really starting to piece it together, had pieced it together in a lot of ways. Like you're in the early stages of the Attitude Era. You could see the true creative shift from 97 to 98, where 97 was starting to bring it to the fold. 98, you were full bore into it. This was fucking Austin era. This was no holds barred, this was balls to the walls, assholes and elbows, shit and get time, as my coach used to say. Um, you, you could tell, like, they had a lot of momentum here. Everybody seemed to have a gimmick that was interesting. The crowd was into all of this shit. Like, yeah, you would get some dumb and stupid stuff, but in general, like, this is where they were really hitting their rhythm and really, you know, figuring shit out and taking things to an entirely different level. Um, so going back and watching this show, like, and you compare it to now, like, it almost makes you feel really, really sad because you see what you used to see, and now you see what you do see. Uh, but when you look at this show, like, you started off with the Headbangers and Takamichi Noku winning a six-man tag over Kai and Tai. Like, fucking hilarious going back and watching Kai and Tai and watching Takamichi Noku. Uh, I just think of Taka and Fudaki, obviously, later on with Kai and Tai. Indeed. You see, like, everybody had a fucking gimmick. And some of them really stupid. Some of them really over the top. Some of them were incredibly cheesy. But by God, that shit connected. It resonated. It worked. It was fucking fun. And you know, Taka, while this match didn't go that long, which was a kind of a running theme a lot of times with the Attitude Era, they didn't need to. Like, get in, get your shit in, and get the fuck out of there. Like in today's business, this would be a 20-minute fucking opening match where nobody sold shit. There was no psychology. It was just a bunch of moves. Everybody's got to get to crap in. Instead, here, this match went, I think, less than eight or seven, even seven minutes. But everybody still managed to get some stuff in, and the finish worked. And the Michinoku driver is still badass all these years later. He had two King of the Rings semifinal matches. The first one, Ken Shamrock defeated the Memphis mid-card piece of crap, as he should have. And then The Rock defeated Dan the Beast Severin in a few minutes with some shenanigans. So it was setting up to a King of the Ring final between Ken Shamrock and The Rock, which was, you know, a continuation in some ways of their feud that had led to the match at WrestleMania. So certainly on board with that. One of those underrated rivalries, I think, in The Rock's career. When you think about great opponents for him, Ken Shamrock certainly was one. Uh, probably one of the stupidest matches, <laughs> but perfect for the era and time does not hold up well, mind you now, is too much taking on Al Snow and Head. That's right. What does everybody want? Head! What does everybody need? Head! 
<laughs> Al Snow's tag team partner was fucking head, and then of course Jerry the King Waller's a special referee. <laughs> you look back at too much, and you see another year plus later what they turned into. You can see at the moment that you have a little bit of something, but they didn't know what the fuck they had, and sometimes it takes a little time to figure it out. And you change the gimmick, and you know you pair him with Rikishi, and you're off to the fucking races, man. But uh, <laughs> this match. You can tell JR was ashamed and embarrassed to call this fucking match. <laughs> the finish. Jerry the King Lawler gets a bottle of head and shoulder shampoo. Puts it on head. And Brian Christopher pins it. One, two, three. You get it? Head and shoulders pin. <laughs> Oh, that's too much fun. Uh, X-Pac versus Owen Hart. You know, honestly, a match you probably could have won in a little more time, but again, when you look at the era in time, it wasn't one of those things where every match needs you to go 20 fucking minutes. You get in, you tell your story, you get your shit in, you get the fuck out of there. You know, at this time, Owen Hart is a member of the Nation of Domination. Like, this is good shit, man. <laughs> I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> I love it. Uh, tag team match for the WWF Tag Team Championship. It was the New Age Outlaws taking on the new Midnight Express. Yeah, you obviously see with X-Pac and, you know, now the New Age Outlaws. You had plenty of influence from DX on this fucking show. Uh, the new Midnight Express. <laughs> you can tell that King and JR were confused. Who's bodacious and who's bombastic? They must have went back and forth like three, four different fucking times. You can tell Jim Cornette thought this shit was stupid. He take <laughs> Poor Bart Gunn. Not so much Bob Holly. Fuck him, but... Hey, it, was, it was okay, I guess. The New Age Outlaws get their shit in. You got China there looking all massive and getting involved, and that's all you need to know about that. Um, but you really get past all this other undercard shit, and you really get to the last three matches of the show, and that's where the money's made here. Ken Shamrock beats The Rock via submission in the King of the Ring final match. And I'm going to say right now, like, when I think about my favorite feuds of The Rock's career, like, Shamrock's up in the mix. You know, he's in that category with Rock when you're talking about the Mankinds and the Austins and the Triple H's of the world, like, He's on that level. Like, the, the chemistry between these two is outstanding. The story these two were able to tell was phenomenal. I loved every bit of it. And, you know, what I find so interesting here is Shamrock was a freaking king of the ring, but never became world champion. And we always will see people talking about, you know, likes, the guys the likes of Mr. Perfect or Scott Hall. And understandable, like, Jake the Snake Roberts, like, hey, these are some of the biggest stars that were never world champion. Yeah, absolutely. And Ken Shamrock absolutely deserves to be on that list. Now, when you look at the moment in time, and you look at the period that he was there, maybe it's a bit of bad timing. If you've been there a couple of years before, he absolutely could have been champion. But you, know, you weren't going to have him be champion over Austin or later on The Rock or some of these other guys. Like, it all worked out. It's just, if anything, Shamrock was a victim of his time, but... Always liked Shamrock and thought he brought good shit to the table. Um, and then we get to the match that everybody knows this show for. The Hell in a Cell match, The Undertaker versus Mankind. And, you know, you could talk ad nauseum about this match. But back in 1998, I goes, this is truly some groundbreaking shit on a WWF scale. Like, this was shit that WCW couldn't answer. And when you combine... The spots in the match with the stories and the characters and the production values and everything else, ECW couldn't match it either. Like this, I always point to this. This was the moment in time to me that WCW and ECW were ultimately fucked. Because you used to go to WCW because you see the familiar names and the characters and the big stars. Well, now WWF had big stars. You go to ECW because... They would do the extreme, crazy, violent shit. Well, now you come here to WWF and they're doing the extreme, crazy, violent shit. And you get enough of that, like, you get to a point where 
people aren't as inv invested in ECW because now they can go elsewhere. They're not as invested in WCW because they can go elsewhere. And there's not a ton of evidence to necessarily support it because, you know, WCW was still doing really good business, especially from a rating standpoint throughout 98 and into 99. But, you know, I think there was a representation of a seismic shift in terms of while well, WWF was already kind of winning the ratings and winning some of the live attendance battles, um, you know, like this was a big moment. And when you think about this, this was a big moment in the career of The Undertaker and Mankind. You know, this put Mankind on an entirely different level. Like, he and Taker had a phenomenal rivalry, a phenomenal story over the past couple of years. And this kind of serving in for some ways as a form of a big blow-off to all of that. I mean, when you look back at this match, like, you all know the first spot. It's the second spot that should make you cringe because that wasn't really planned and could have really fucking go wrong, gone wrong. And if you hear Mick Foley talk about it, like usually you like to get up for the choke slam. And if he had gotten up for the choke slam, it would have been a hell of a lot worse ending than what it would have been. Thankfully, he didn't. Like just the the badassery is all I can say. The badassery of mankind to be able to sit there and take that first table spot, get up. Climb back up to the top of the fucking cage, take a choke slam, land on his back on the apron, the spot that really fucking hurts, and then say, hey, you know what? You know what this match needs? It's a fucking thumbtacks. Like, obviously, this is a memorable match, a memorable moment in time. It will live on forever. And, you know, it's something truly special that Taker and Mick Foley can look at this and say, you know what? We did something that will outlive us. We did something that will live forever in wrestling history, and it absolutely will. And it is a great, phenomenal match to go back and watch. You know, and it still holds up relatively well. But then I wonder just how well it really holds up. Because it's the matches like this, where they pushed the envelope too far, they did too much shit, that younger marks, younger fans, started to watch and say, hey... I want to do this shit, but I don't want to learn how to become a character. I don't want to learn how to be an actual storyteller to where you would get to a two plus year feud that's been off and on that leads to this culmination, leads to this point to get this level of blow off where it's necessitated like this. They didn't have that. A lot of these guys just go out there and they do these spots and they fucking kill themselves. And you know, when you talk about people that had a negative influence on wrestling, as much as I love and respect Mick Foley for everything that he did for the business, what he put his body through, how versatile and entertaining of a performer he was as both a heel and a babyface, the reality is, when you think about American professional wrestling, he's been one of the most negative influences over the past 25 years. He really has been. Because a lot of the younger fans that are now the marks in the business sat there and watched him and used him as an influence and forgot how to do all the, learn how to do all the other shit that Foley could actually fucking do. Like talk, be a character, you know, tell stories and they can't do any of that shit. They just do the fucking spots and try to take the spots to a different level. So as much as thinking about a match like King of the Ring 98, the Hell in a Cell, like invokes some positive memories, it invokes some negative ones for me as well. Because I think in some ways it did more harm than good for the business. It did more harm than good for the future of the product. And I think we've seen some of the damage of that. And it's not just this one match or this one moment in time because it, it's kind of that whole era spawned an era of folks that focused too much on the spots and shit and didn't learn how to become characters who could tell stories. So it's not all positive. It's a lot of fun to go back and watch. You know, truly. And hats off to Foley for being such a fucking beast. And then what's crazy about it the part that always seems to get forgotten about when you talk about this match and all this shit that mankind went through is that he still had to come back out that night because you had the main event was the first blood match for the WWF championship where if Kane lost, he agreed he was going to set himself on fire and if Austin lost, you know, he would drop the title. First blood match. And... My God, fucking Mankind came out in this one too. Like, you know, I find it really interesting that 
at the peak of Austin's run in 1998, like this is really truly the peak, the height of his powers. He had won the title from Sean at WrestleMania 14. Like you were going with him and McMahon, him and McMahon, you know, and you even had the McMahons appear during the show and do a fucking segment. Like the shit with Patterson smacking Sable on the ass and her turning around and smacking the French out of his mouth. <laughs> um, you know, it was fascinating to me that they made the call at this point, 98, to take the strap off of Austin. Now, sure, it was for one fucking day, and then he immediately got the title back the next night on Raw, but god damn. <laughs> but think about that. Like, they had Austin at the peak of his power. Kane beat him. Yeah, it was for one night. But he sure the fuck did beat him by hook or by crook. The interference, the run-ins, and all that other bullshit. At the end of the day, Austin bled. You know, not to mention the wounds he had on his back in the first moment or two of the match that they had to play off and say, no, 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 no. The referee's got to use some common sense here. <laughs> but it was a good finish. Decent enough match. But let, let's be real here again. Like, the only thing that anybody remembers from the show is the Hell in a Cell match. It's the only thing anybody talks about. And in and of itself, it is absolutely timeless. There is no question about it. But for all the good that it meant for the company at the time, and for all the fun that it was to watch it back 20 plus years ago, and even fun to watch it now, its impact and legacy on the business is not necessarily a great one. 